Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Sam Sipton. I'm an assistant managing editor of the New York Times. And I'm here with my old pal and good friend and close colleague, Kim Severson, national food correspondent for the Times. We're going to be here for the next uh, hour having a virtual happy hour with all of you. And we're really looking forward to it. So pull up a chair, pour yourself a drink, and um, let's talk about food. Kim, I'm gonna start the way I start virtually every meeting these days by saying, asking, how are you? Uh, you know, it just depends on the minute. Uh, it's just a funny thing, right? So sometimes I feel great and hopeful and we're all healthy and doing our thing. And then other times I'm just, uh, you know, the slightest thing just sends me down the river. Um, but I have learned that, uh, you know, given that we don't know what's happening or what's coming our way, that if I just sit, if I just relax for a minute, however I'm feeling will go away and a new feeling will come up. So I'm mostly just learning to uh, just sit on my hands when it gets weird. Um, you know, I'm in Atlanta, right? So that's a whole different thing than people who are in New York and other cities that have a much different uh, circumstance. Cause here it's all willy nilly. You could do whatever you want apparently, so. Well, but it's not, it, I mean, but you're experiencing uh, this pandemic in a, in a different way than a, than a lot of us are. Um, you, as we say in the newspaper business really ran toward this fire. And although your brief is food, you've spent um, pretty much most of the last month working on our obituaries desk, um, mm -hmm. recognizing that we would have an increased number of notable deaths and interesting, and, and, and just putting a face to the, to the names of the, of the dead. What's that experience been like? Well, we're doing two, you know, we, we are doing two different kinds of obituaries. So we do the New York Times obituaries that we do for notable people, um, you know, that are the, the more, um, you know, sort of thoughtful news driven and these people have long careers there's reasons why we're writing about them and then we're doing a lot of these that we call those they lost those we've lost that are just smaller just snippets of people i did a, a 25 year old a young woman in the bronx who was training to be a family therapist i did um a kind of 40 something kind of community activist politician guy down here and they're just small little notable um, remembrances of people. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting experience because a lot of times when you do this, you call someone up and you're say, you know, people are interested in who they work, who can they, can you, what do you want people to know about the person that you lost? And it, it's, you're sort of part therapist and sometimes you're just listening to them, you know, recount what happened when the person passed on. Sometimes you're hearing their their pain of the person dying alone in a hospital. Other times they're like, oh, they were the greatest person. They're so excited to tell you. I had an interesting email I got today from, um, there was a fellow named Richard Friedman who was a, a an analyst, a, kind of an Upper West Side analyst who was pretty significant. And he wrote a fairly significant book on male homosexuality in the eighties and was a, um, a well-known, it's kind of a, a prickly and well-known psychoanalyst and the things you learn about the world of psychoanalyst when you, is that a word? Um, <laughs> it is now. So anyway, but his uh, son just wrote to me and said, you know, it was great to have something in the Times because we all couldn't get together to do any kind of a memorial service. And so hearing from all the people around the country who knew my dad and because they read the obituary and we all connected, he said it was a little bit of having a, um, you know, a little bit of a memorial service sort of virtually. So it feels like good service. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's 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 sad and it feels like what you should you know it's something that we can do to help people so in that way it's good I, and I, I can always start the conversation with or ask people wh how what do they like to eat where do they like to go out and that is like a unifying way in with in these very hard conversations you know it's a way to get uh to get immediately comfortable with somebody and everybody's got the things about how they like to eat and you know, what their favorite food was or what they like to do. And so that I found that my food thing um, has been a nice little door opener when you cold call somebody and say, tell me about a person you just lost. You know, I think that's so, um, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that there's something about the coverage of food, the celebration of food, the understanding of food that we try and bring forth in NYT cooking and in other places that is 
by nature empathetic. And mm-hmm. I think that kind of radical empathy um, is super important uh, in, in news cycles like this one, when we're both, when we're kind of documenting a lot of sadness, um, uh, grief, stress, trouble, and food does seem to make um, a difference. So we'll turn to that. I, I just want to give a quick piece of housekeeping, um, which is, guess what? You're being recorded. That's number one. And number two, um, you can submit questions to us at any time during the event using the live chat comment section on uh, YouTube. And uh, we'll get to those uh, questions in in due course. Um, So food. Kim, what role is food playing in your life right now? And how's it different from the before? Because it's wildly different for me. Yeah, I, you know, it's, um, I did a thing where I just uh, entered into the phase a lot of people did, which was the pandemic, no holds barred, screw it. Dot. Like I was like, we're in a pandemic. I can eat this pint of Jenny's almond butter brickle ice cream. <laughs> it's not a advertise. It's truly like, I think the best ice cream on the planet, that particular flavor. So I was, you know, so some of my food was just, um, indulging in whatever felt good to put in my mouth, which was kind of great, uh, in a, for a while, except for now I'm, you know, got the, I gained the COVID-19 as they say, so <laughs> not quite, but you know, so that was, that was an interesting change in how I usually eat. Cause I'm, I'm usually really much more, uh, mindful about what I eat and I cook a lot, you know, um, but because we're home all the time and usually I'm traveling, I think two to three weeks out of the month I'm on a plane or I'm back and forth to go do my job or come and see you guys in New York or um and and eating out so not going to restaurants has been kind of great in a way it's kind of horrible in a way but it's also great we have you know family dinner you know we're we're all cooking a lot more I'm a 12 year old and partner and you know that dinner time is a bit like that's our thing that's like a it's become this anchor of the day, you know I think that's I, I think that's true for a lot of our readers. Um we're hearing it day and night in the in, yeah. in the email sent to the desk and, and the like. It's interesting for me, um, you know, I, I I used to be a restaurant junkie. Um, I was the restaurant critic of the times. So I ate out all the time. As food editor, um, I needed to do that still. Um, but as the cooking editor, I spent a lot of time like developing recipes at home. And so my kids never got the same thing. Right, right. right? It was always like, I'm testing a new recipe, testing a new recipe. And they would have it three times and then never again. But now I'm just, I'm just freestyling. And it's been kind of exciting and kind of fun. And the kids seem to, I'm, I'm here with a a 16 year old and an 18 year old and my wife, and they, they seem pretty happy. I'm, I'm certainly taking pleasure from it. Um, and I, 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 I mean, I'd love to go to a restaurant right now, but I'm taking the pleasure I can. Yeah. And you know, one thing we came up with, there's now like we do takeout Tuesdays because we want to support restaurants that we liked that we're trying to do takeout. So we do takeout, but I'm not as thrilled. I mean, we do, it, I, I do it kind of just to support restaurants and it's maybe on a Tuesday night where we're busy. It's, you know, it's a, it's a break from cooking, but it's not as pleasurable or, del- you know, it's not as delicious as- No, takeout food, food is just it's, not that. It's, it's, it's just It's always that. sad. It's kind of sad. Um, we are doing a lot of your, a modified version of your pan pizza in my cast iron pan, because that's nice. what I like go to. But I have to say that, um, because I don't know about it, I, I, because this job I've been I've been working harder than I. I mean, it's busy. Like there's just news. It's a huge news story. So I feel like I'm just typing away all the time. And people are like her. I mean, appreciate that people have more time on their hands, but they're like, do, you know, do you want to join the kombucha club? And I'm like, who has time for a kombucha club? So I'm watching with envy everybody with their sourdough starters in there. But anyway, we've been using the Trader Joe's pizza dough sometimes, which uh-huh. is a terrible wow. thing. To say. Uh, but you know, you can punch it down and let it rise and punch it down in the oil and olive oil in the cast iron pan. And then we do, you know, we always have some homemade sauce around and then use your technique for cooking it. But that cast iron pan pizza modified version of yours, it's a go-to in our house now. It's well, great. I'm, I'm overjoyed to, to, to hear it. My and for those issue... of you looking at home, I'm not sucking up to Sam right now. Yeah. It's th- those days are long gone. So 
<laughs> it's funny you mentioned the sourdough um, starter. I um, I ran out of yeast, I don't know, a month and a half ago. And um, there's none to be had in, in, in my local store. Um, I do have a sourdough starter. I've written articles about sourdough starters. I work with my sourdough starter all the time. My sourdough starter makes exceptional waffles and pancakes. But my sourdough starter is not, as they say in the sourdough game, active. And no matter how much I feed it, we've got a, a reader here who says, why am I the only one in America who can't successfully make a sourdough starter? And I say, Kathleen, you're not alone. There are many starters that are inactive or lame. Mine is what one of- if it's inactive? Does, do you just have to like, you're like, sorry, I'm done with you. I'm breaking up. Goodbye, sourdough starter. Or can you revive it? Or is this- Oh, no, I try and revive it. I try for a while. You know, I keep it in the fridge and I'll bring it out and feed it for three days in a row, four days in a row. And then I'll make a, I'll make a sourdough boule and it looks like, uh, you know, a Frisbee for the Wesleyan College ultimate Frisbee team. And, and, I'm, and I just want to, I just want to throw myself in front of a train. Aren't you supposed to like leave them out so the natural yeast fall into it or something? Oh or yeah, 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 that's part of it. I mean, once it's active, this is, this is you just it's like kind of but, but, but I've got news. One of our colleagues, um, Becky Hughes, who you know, sent, she got, she got a, she got a connection and got five pounds of active yeast. And she just said, it was like a, and then this brick, she sent me a brick of it. Like a drug, like a, like a serious drug deal, like a federal, like a federal level like a long time yeah. drug deal. And I got this bindle full of, uh, of yeast. I'm off to the races. Okay, but now, so are you breaking up with your other starter? With no, your, no, 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 no. I'm hoping are, that the Are you presence, cheating on that starter with the new yeast? How does this work? No, the, 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 it's an open relationship. Okay, okay. We were clear about it from the beginning. All right. That's what they always say. <laughs> <laughs> it never works well. I, I know. So um, <laughs> another uh, question from our, our readers goes to what we're drinking tonight. Um ah. what, what are you drinking, Sam? What's in there? I'm drinking some bourbon. I'm drinking some bourbon and a tumbler. Very simple. That's good. Just a big tumbler, Yeti tumbler of bourbon. That's Yeti good. tumbler of bourbon. It's very on <laughs> brand. Later, no. I'll have a lucky strike. That's right. Well, here's my lovely cocktail, uh, which you know, I am... Um, I uh, have been sober for 20 years. And so I do not have a tumbler of bourbon because if I had a tumbler of bourbon, I would not have this job. So, um, uh-oh, my friend just texted me and said, you called her Kathleen and it's Kathleen. Is that right, Kathleen? Okay, just for the record. Wow. Why am I getting like, like I'm getting, um, I'm getting, you know, heckled from on the text here. This is hilarious. Okay. That is hilarious. I'm sorry, Kathleen. Kathleen, see, there you go. Um, but anyway, but I, so I'm drinking a shrub with some uh, Meyer lemon and fizzy water. And this shrub in particular, a shrub's like a, sort of like drinking vinegar, kind of, you could call it. Mm -hmm. This was, this one is a mystery shrub because I have like all these little jars of various shrubs that I've made throughout time and they get better or worse with time. And it's, you know, you can take fruit or whatever, you know, you have and you, fruit and a little sugar and you kind of let that just hang out for a while and then you can add depending on like apple cider vinegar goes with some things white wine vinegar goes better with others and I was taking my apple peels and apple cores for a while and simmering them down and having a little base and then using that with some other fruit whatever seasonal you know fruit I had or things so this one I think has that apple base and I am guessing that it is it might be um some strawberries from la like might even a year ago because this stuff lasts forever. So I'm trying to go through all my little jars of shrubs, but it's quite good. It's really nice. And it's a little bit tart. You know, the big problem with non-alcoholic drinks is- um, too sugary. Yeah. And so, you know, um, besides the dumb name of mocktail, but it's tough. And even people who like ginger beer can even be too sugary for me. I don't want to drink sugar all night. A lot of times I just will have, at a, if I go, and this is probably be controversial among people who are in the sobriety community watching this, but sometimes I'll just have soda water and bitter and lemons, like some bar bitters. And that's a great 
thing for me, you know, and it's, uh, it's a little refreshing. And it's controversial and, because of course there are trace amounts of alcohol. Little and, bit, yeah. Know. And some people feel like that is for some people just way too much alcohol. So um, yeah, but this is, is quite nice. And you know, it's nice because I haven't gotten out my fancy glasses that much and I haven't like sat with somebody and just had a chat. So this is actually quite a, it's kind of lovely. You know? Can I can I ask a, um, a, a potentially indelicate um, question about sobriety in the age of the coronavirus? Sure. Why would this? Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, just because well, there's anonymity the involved in the rooms, right. and I, I'm, I'm just I'm curious about meetings, um, which are so important to keeping people um, sober and keeping them alive, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, so central to sobriety, and then they become disaggregated because of the coronavirus. Right. Well, um, you know, I think people have been in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous for a while are uh, are pretty protective of their program and pretty ingenious. And so it didn't take long for the sober, the people who had meetings um, to, to kind of reorganize on Zoom. And uh, in the beginning, they hadn't, people hadn't quite figured out the, like how to do the password protected Zoom thing. So there was Zoom bombing happening. And so I was not in any of the meetings, but there was like, people would flash um, pictures of people chugging beer on the Zoom meetings for- Oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> I know, it's very funny. Most, most people just laughed about that. But, but what's been really interesting, I was in Brooklyn, lived in New York for a long time. And when I first moved there, started going to this morning meeting in Brooklyn that was like just a, a very good friends, sober pals in that meeting and went a lot in the mornings. And now I get to go back to those meetings. So I'll go and hang out in the Brooklyn meeting. And, uh, you know, it's very, there are people who are newly sober in those meetings and, you know, getting sober in a pandemic. I mean, God bless them. And they're in there doing it. And there are people who, um, are just going through their stuff. So I, I feel like I, I, for me personally, have actually been able to engage more in AA. I mean, I always had my, like, I'm kind of a, I'm like a two meeting a week person. I get by with one. I talk to people. I do like, I kind of, I've been doing this for 20 years. I kind of know what works and, but now I get to go to more and uh, you'll be in a meeting with someone from Australia and someone from, you know, uh, Europe and there, so you it's this great kind of mix and you feel like there is this giant world of millions of people who like you don't drink anymore so it's been kind of uh cool um I think every I think there's probably some magic like anything you would like to be face to face with people but it's been very cool and uh I would encourage anybody who you know feels like they want to join in and see what it's like to not drink or need some support it's it's worked for me so that's my little AA plug well, thank you, Kim, for sharing that. That's the yeah. that's that's the nicest I've felt in quite a few hours. So thank you. you. Yeah. Um, we'll save uh, you a seat, Sam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just finish this. <laughs> Last one. Listen, I'm all for it. I think I love it when people drink. I'm like, please drink. Have a good time. Um, we've got a question from Andrew, um, who's posing to us the challenge of what restaurant would we go to first if we could what immediately comes to mind oh okay i will i i i would <laughs> it's interesting because i went to a restaurant last night and i feel weird oh, saying that that's right Tell, uh, okay andrew we'll be back to answer your question later so Kim, yeah. tell us about your experience last night so um you know it, uh, it, georgia has opened allowed restaurants to start a, a week ago a week ago monday they allowed restaurants to open up and not that many did at first, a few. Uh, and uh, so I, there was, uh, there's a, a restaurant group here that uh, kind of caters to the Buckhead crowd. And there's a, a restaurant called Chops, which is a, you know, it's a steakhouse. It, it, I think it was probably had its biggest moments in like the late nineties to early 2000s. It's like that. Let suburb. me just interrupt for a sec. Buckhead is, is that sort of well to do. Yeah. It's a, it's a little bit North of it's in Atlanta proper, but it's a wealthy suburb of, um, uh, of Atlanta in, um, you know, it's, it's kind of where the money goes around and, you know, people drive up in their fancy cars. It's like the, I think it's the land where valet parking was invented. I'm not sure, but. Uh, so anyway, this restaurant is next to this big St. Regis hotel and, uh, you know, Chops was sort of where, you know, there's, there's like two big steakhouses in town and you're in one camp or the other. And 
So this restaurant group, I wrote about them for another story and they were gonna open. They opened on this Tuesday, last night was their second night. So I went and ate with a producer for our, our uh, podcast, The Daily. Um, and we decided we would go and see what it felt like. And it, has, it had been two months and I, since I'd sat in a restaurant. And so, I mean, that's a long, and I didn't realize I was going in. And it, the first thing that was weird is you drive up and there's a valet. And I was like, I'm not going to valet. Like, I'm going to let, I mean, first of all, this poor valet guy with his mask get in my car where he doesn't, I've been breathing in and I'm going to get out. So I said, no, thank you. I'll go self park. Although I did an interview with a restaurant group and they had, took 50 reservations last night and of them 49 we were the one that didn't 49 used the valet so we wow. walked in in our gloves and our mask and they have the things on the floor and the host stand with the sanitizer and we walked in the restaurant and we were the only ones in the restaurant who had masks and gloves on um i mean besides the wait staff so that was a little people just wanted to be out the bar was you know two people and then six feet and two people and six feet um, using paper menus, um, not so that they could dispose of them. And their system is the waiters are jackets and ties and face masks. And the waiters who take your order and, br and bring you your food are not the same people who then are gloved up and who take dirty plates away. So the staff, the, like the waiter never has to touch a plate that a, someone in the public has touched. Um, and I got to tell you, there was a minute though, when I, first, I was nervous, you know, and I'm kind of, you know, but people were just dressed up and the idea of having someone put a ribeye in front of me and could eat it. And, you know, my person I was with, you know, or like the, the, they do the wine, like touchless with one of these things. And the, it was, it was, there was a moment. It felt good. I'm not going to lie to you. I was scared and it felt great. Wow. It sounds surreal in a way. It very, but you know, we were talking about masks, right? So there's a restaurant group uh, that has asked that their servers not wear masks and they reopen. It's a Houston based group or it's a Texas based group, Houston's, because they felt like it didn't look like service. But for me, you know, the waiter came up all the time. You could tell he had just put sanitizer on every time he came to the table. There were sanitizing stations everywhere. And I felt like that was a real piece of hospitality for my waiter to have a mask and be clean and come to my table. I felt like that was, if hospitality is about being cared for, right? About being made safe in a place, that I thought that was a good a good piece of, of whatever. But I did feel like um, I got kind of lulled into thinking everything was fine. I could see where my own protocols might get loose. And because for a minute, it's like, I was telling people, it's like falling, asleep. it's like in the Wizard of Oz when they fall asleep in the field of poppies. Right. It's like, oh, but you know, I think the monk, the flying monkeys are coming at any time. So it was, you know, but it was something. I mean, I felt good to be at a table eating again at a, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it, it definitely moved me some. So it's interesting, right? I, I long for that experience, right? To get back to Andrew's question, I would love, you know, to be able to, to, to walk into, um, you know, uh, to just near the office into China Shang, yeah, a man. great Hunanese restaurant that I love beyond measure, and sit down and 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 be served these dishes that I I, I love. But when those restaurants reopen in, in New York, they're going to be under similar whatever they end up being guidelines, and there's no way they're going to be allowed to be as tight as they were which means let's say conservatively 50% capacity at any time. That's not a way, those businesses can't stay in business at, at that rate, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you, how, we've reported, you've reported some staggeringly high percentages of restaurant, independent restaurants that, that could close. I think our latest number was up like 70%. And if 70% of independent restaurants in the United States or in New York um, close as a result of the coronavirus shutdowns, like what happens to restaurants? What happens to those that remain? Yeah, that's a good question, right? That's the question of the hour. And, you know, we don't know what protocols will change with time as we understand more about the virus. So it may be right now it, it's like, going to the dental hygienist maybe, but maybe that'll change. And maybe these restaurants 
you know, they'll find ways to do table service, which will be a special thing for that restaurant. And there will be, you know, they'll be slicker about what takeout they do. So, you know, that was, you know, Grubhub and all those places that were just taking huge chunks out of restaurants pockets. Maybe they'll figure out how to do more seamless to go stuff and, and be able to get some revenue stream there. Um, I mean, I don't know. There will probably be, I mean, let, look, the restaurant business was overheated, right? There were more new places opening than we could all go to. And it was getting to be where restaurants weren't that, maybe not that special in a way. And we were kind of like, oh, this club, you tried that new time. That's terrible. I'm not going to, you know, you know they were just getting, it was too much. So maybe now they will become more special and restaurants a will lot find of a way to make, I, I don't know. I mean, look, I don't, we don't, nobody knows how this is going to play out and so hopefully it won't be 75% don't come back. And the ones that do, I think, will be, be that much more special. I, I I don't know. I don't know. I think it would be helpful, Kim, because um, we've got a question here about visiting small or independent restaurants as opposed to these multi-restaurant groups. Um, and of course, above that, in terms of size, are the kind of um, you know the 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 chain restaurants and and the like. Can you kind of just quickly give us a sense of the the ecosystem of American restaurants, because I think that we talk often about restaurant groups. And I've, in my own reporting, I've talked to a couple of restaurant group owners um, who say, actually, we're just small businesses like anyone else. We, we haven't broken through to, to be gigantic yet. We're three, four restaurants. That doesn't make us, you know, multinationals. Um, but I, I think it would be helpful if you could sort of sketch out the tiers that you and your reporting are looking at, because we're not really dealing with fast food, right? No, and then that's the problem when it comes to people like, well, the, will the restaurant industry come back and how do we cover? And every, re I mean, restaurants are vastly different, right? So um, the small pho shop that is down the street, maybe that is... Um, you know, their food, like, you know, is making pho and noodles. That's not a big food cost. They can sell them for a fairly high thing, but it's also maybe just three or four people running it and they scratch together enough money to, to rent their little storefront. So that's one kind of a restaurant. Um, you have some place that, you know, there's a, a guy who was just opening um, kind of a sort of a hipster tasting menu place. Uh, you know, he had a couple of investors, not a lot, but he's, was sort of piecing it together and uh, just had opened when all this hit. And he's actually doing kind of great. He immediately was, he wasn't so tied in with his investors and things that he couldn't start doing these kind of like, he perfected the art of the tasting menu to go kind of, and that uh -huh. became the art of how we put it together. And he's um, he's kind of doing, doing pretty well. And then you have restaurants that are um, like a Steven Satterfield or I suppose like Gabrielle Hamilton to agree, you know, Prune that are one restaurant, they, maybe don't have a ton of investors, a few, but they're, you know, that's what they're operating. Their wine sales and beer sales are what makes their money. Then maybe, you know, they, he might get big and open two or three like Miller Union next door and get bigger. And, but that, that, that is what most of our restaurants are. That's the majority of, of restaurants. There are not that many big, I mean, there are chains everywhere, but as companies, there's like the big National Restaurant Association chains then there's this whole group in the middle that, you know, is mo where most of us go. And I don't know what, I, I mean, I, you know, the profit margins are what, like three to 5% on a good day, you know? Right. And then the thing that's hard is starting up again, like a lot of these restaurants were selling their wine supply and their liquor supply as part of their to-go thing and to make enough money. So, and they had the bills from the vendors. So like, just to start up again, you've got to re-up and buy all that liquor again. You've got to, kind of try to get straight with your suppliers if they're still out there. If you still have the relationship with the farmer, if you still, you made sure you paid all your bills so the guy's gonna bring the cans of tomato paste because you don't owe him too much money. Like it costs money to start up, you know? So yeah. it's not like you can just go, great, our doors are open. And you have to get all those people back who now are making maybe more money on unemployment than they were at your restaurant because they've added this extra level of it. So, and then do they want to, do they feel safe coming back? You know, and then, how do you, so it's just a, it's, it's so much more complex. And I, that's why I think you'll see the big chains will figure it out and they'll do their thing. And the little tiny places will probably be pretty agile. 
So those ones in the middle that I think are going to get hosed. Oh, well, that's a really interesting uh, point of view. And I think um, that'll be a really good line of reporting for you going forward. Speaking of reporting. Yeah, it just gave uh, me an assignment. Do you guys see how that works? Yeah. Never give your boss an idea <laughs> that you get an assignment. It, but yeah, now the rest is typing. Yeah. Um, okay. Where do you, so are, is there a fancy, are you feel like your appetite for really fancy food and a big fancy New York restaurant is going to be heightened or are you going to find that to be a bunch of silliness and not something that's going to satisfy you once we can go back, Sam? You know, it's interesting. I had a correspondence with, um, with a, with a super high, um, so can I point out that you are into air quotes tonight? Just yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. It's cute. I'll, I'll, I'm going to sit on my hands. Okay. But anyway, go ahead. Um, I had a conversation um, with um, someone who is in that kind of high-end dining situation. And he pointed out that there were a couple of restaurants that opened coming out of the um, economic downturn in 2008 that, that kind of defied logic. And the best example... What, was Marea, um, a fine dining um, kind of luxe seafood establishment on Central Park South, um, and which I reviewed. And, and, and I remember the review being like, well, I guess the economy's coming back because we're, we're, we're stuck in a recession, but there are people spending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on, on this experience, which was, since it wasn't my hundreds and hundreds of dollars, but the New York Times is, I can tell you, definitively was awesome. Now that, that, that was an economic recession. It wasn't a global pandemic, but I do think that there is a part of me. I mean, you know, I was, I was working in a plaid shirt all day today. I rooted around and found a blazer. Um, and, you and look very nice. Cause I wanted to dress up for you, Kim. Thank you. And I wanted to dress up for this audience. And, and, and so I, and so I did. Um, and the reason I did that was because on Monday, uh, the New York Times was awarded three Pulitzer Prizes, and we had our get together as we always do on Pulitzer Day. It's a big day at the New York Times, a joyous day when we win. And it was such a thrill to see our winning colleagues uh, in coats and ties and, and beautiful dresses, um, uh, you know, kind of accepting these awards on, 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 and, and talking with their colleagues a, a, about it. And I, I don't know, I'd, I'd like to do that in a, in a restaurant, I think. I'd like, I'd like to be able to walk into Del Posto in New York City and hear the piano player and have a martini and sit down and have some amazing meal. I think that could be I don't think a lot of restaurants are going to be able to pull that off, but one or two might, um, because the rest of the time we're going to be cooking more at home because we've learned how to do it during this pandemic. And we're going to be supporting those little independent pho shops that you're talking about that have uh, managed to be agile and figure out a way to make it work. Can I ask you a cooking uh, just, just sort of from your perch? So see how she's turned the whole thing around where I was asking her questions and now she's asking me questions. Well, I'm trying, to, ahead, stay, trying to stay in my lane, Sam. Um, so, but, but you guys have, you know, we have all the um, amazing people who run the cooking app and who are sorting through recipes and watching what people are cooking and interacting on Facebook and all the places. So, uh, uh, and some of the cooking that people have done are like newbies in the kitchen are like, look, I made foamy coffee or whatever. And no, I can make my look. I made a thing. And, a, and then there are people who are more sophisticated cooks who are using it. But what have you noticed like trend lines over, like, have we been cooking more? Do, do you think people are getting better okay. at cooking? Can you tell from your perch or uh, absolutely the data? We, what is, what is the we, data? We are definitely cooking more. Um, um, NYT cooking is, um, is a healthy business um, and it was a healthy business going into uh, the lockdowns. Um, our audience size is roughly twice what it was uh, before the pandemic. Um, and people are taking advantage of our offerings um, 
like never before. So what's popular? And what's been like, what are people super, cooking? Huh? Super popular. But what and, recipes, like what are people cooking? Well, this is the interesting thing, right? See kids we, at home, how he was kind of going off into business. I wanted to get him into the recipes. So we just moved him. That's a reporter technique. You can reporting use reporting 101 with go ahead. This is we're gonna sell you next. <laughs> a master class with Kim Severson. Um, what's fascinating about what we're cooking and how we're cooking is that it really does. And I've written about this in uh, the NYT cooking newsletter, which I hope you subscribe to. Um, it vacillates, right? It or it oscillates between project recipes and simple, easy, get it on the table fast recipes, because we're cooking so much that we're beginning to take pride in our newly found skills or newly developed kitchen muscles. So we're like, yeah, I'm gonna make a Dutch baby on the weekend and that's gonna be great. Or I'm gonna make babka on the weekend, which I've never done before, but I want to. But on that, and tonight is a tough night, Thursday night, right? On that Thursday night when you've been cooking, every, well, you got that takeout on Tuesday, but for a lot of people, they've been cooking, this is four days into the work week and they just want to get something on the table. And, you know, the default is beans, but they're sick of beans. And it's our job to, to kind of swoop in and say, like, here's a really easy skillet pasta recipe that's going to deliver a lot of flavor and joy. Um, and here's the recipe. And, and they're jumping on that. So I love to see how the trend lines show us project and then they show us ease, project, ease, project. Like the big lasagna thing that um, Samin did um, yes. last, which I did. I mean, it was a lot of work, but I did, I got in on, I made all the things, but that got like huge numbers, right? Like people Organic wanting numbers to because, make. Because it, 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 she was creating a dinner party that all of America could attend. And the cost of admission was make a lasagna because that's what she's making. Mm -hmm. And the instruction that we were able to provide that she was able to provide. And then the community that we were able to develop out of the consumption of the lasagnas was really something to see. It was, it was really touching, I thought. And I think it's an indication, at least to me, that this at any rate will stick that people are going to continue to cook at home. And what are you making for dinner tonight? I'm going to make a skillet pasta, to tell you the truth. Um, it was my wife's uh, birthday yesterday. <gasps> Happy birthday. And, oh, I'm sorry, um, on Sunday. Uh, and oh, yeah. um, what, it, what are days? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, her sister sent some, sent some sausages. And yeah. so I'm going to use those sausages in a skillet pasta with some cheese at the end, and it's going to be fantastic. Fantastic. What are you making? Uh, you know, I think we're going to do actually speaking to the simple thing. And this is something that I wasn't doing a lot. I'm going to do your, um, the tofu with the chili crisp and green, oh. beans, but I have asparagus. So I'm going to use the asparagus instead of green beans. And, but I, you, the one thing on this pandemic is I, um, became, uh, one of the many legions of people who for decades and years and, and, you know, centuries have used chili crisp but yep. I have become a chili crisp person um, because of the pandemic. And so- um, No, I, not because of the pandemic, because I wrote an article about chili Because you wrote about chili crisp. That's correct. Right. But I didn't have, I didn't have the um, inspiration to, I don't know why, you know, why would I have, I just felt like I wanted to, I don't know, that was, I guess, my tiny version of the kombucha club or the sourdough. I was going to dedicate myself to a cooking project and it happened to just be, ordering chili crisp and putting it on tofu and baking it. But it's a good, I am excited. I haven't, I haven't done that recipe, but I'm going to, what was that other tofu recipe you gave me the other day when I called you? I was like, I have a, I had, so oh, there's I have a great one from our colleague, Yuwanda Komalafe right, right. Um, with the peanut, peanut butter, with a peanut butter sauce. That's really fantastic. And speaking of peanut butter, adding chili crisp to our, um, well, to my takeout um, sesame noodles recipe. Oh, nice. Is a, is a nice play. That crunchiness in there is 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 really fantastic. Nice. Okay, I like that. I like that. So Kim, um, I'm going to return to a question. But that, I have a follow up after your question. Okay. okay. I just want to know what restaurant you want to go to. God. Um, 
You know, I want to go, do you remember um, a, a little bit before this pandemic hit when you and I and um, our colleague, Carolyn Ryan went to, um, uh, it was- Franchette. A, yeah. Oh no, it was a Franchette. It was the new, it was the Frankie's guys the, who had the new restaurant that by that place, by the thing that we were the one time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I want yeah. to come to. I was, want to come to New York and eat with you guys. Is what that'd I want. be great. You know, be, I want to walk into a restaurant with my buds, and um, I want it to be kind of loud and delicious. And uh, you know, I want. I just want to have uh, like our own little table in the hubbub of a place where you feel like you're, you know, like just like dish after dish of some like thing where we just go, oh, that's great, and you know that that feel is what I what I want you know That's yeah what I, I would I would like for a plate of something I've never eaten before to be served to me and I bite into it and it just makes me crack up it's so good so exactly that's what I want I want a chef who really knows what they're doing feeding me and at a table with somebody that I really love and that would be great or even like very much so <laughs> I'm sad now <laughs> <laughs> haven't um i was curious you published a cookbook mm -hmm. uh called see on sunday right yep uh and it came out right before the this all hit you were we you were in fact i had a thing on my calendar where you were going to come down here and do dinner with us and we were going to do a book thing yeah it was last about, week. you know how those things are popping up i'm like oh sam would have been here then or oh i would have been at that so um i just want to talk about it because it's a great book and i'm not doing this to you know but how did it feel like you have this cookbook that's about coming together at the table at a time in the pandemic, but it's a great book. And I think people are cooking from it. And I, I just, what was it like to go through writing a book and, you know, for people the you know, the book promo life is hard. And I just, I yeah, it was, it was kind of tough. I mean, the pandemic, you know, the shutdown started rolling through while I was on book tour and I was down in Florida thinking like, Holy cats, like I, I spoke to 400 people or something in, in Palm Beach and, and I think 398 of them were like, this isn't a thing. Um, but I got on that plane to fly back to New York and there were like two people on it. Like it was, it was clear that this was done. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I hunkered down the, the next day. Um, personally, I'm, you know, I'm bummed that the book did well, it got onto the New York Times bestseller list. You, you know, were on the Today that, Show, you did all the things. You had and all I did it all, and then it sank like a stone. But, um, but I really do believe that eating and in large groups with people you love and with strangers you don't even know uh, is beneficial to to yourself and 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 to the community in which you live. And I look forward to us getting back to that. No, um, I think the message of the book uh, stands. We're unfortunately in a position where can't do it right now, um, but we can practice. We can practice the empathy that is necessary to, to, to do that. Um, and then we can put it into practice once this pandemic goes away. Yeah. I, um, I long for that. You know, we had a, we have a big dining room table because um, my partner Leslie has lots of family here and um, we have people all the time coming over and we decided that it was just looking sad. So we took one of the big leaps out of our dining room table. It was a sad day. So now our table is smaller and I can't wait till I get to put the leaf in and we get to do the uh, see on Sunday business again. It makes me, I'm, I'm looking forward to that actually. Me too. Hashtag Put the leaf in. Put the leaf in. That's it. That's beautiful. Do thanks, everybody, for joining us here uh, for today's happy hour. And a special thanks to Kim Severson for coming along for the ride, drinking that shrub tomorrow. And that is Friday, May 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. You can join time staff members in a roundtable discussion with journalist Leif Riegstad to discuss his piece on Joe Exotic the subject of the Netflix phenomenon, Tiger King. To find out more about our full slate of digital events, please visit timesevents.nytimes.com. Thanks very much, everyone. You Have are great good day. at that, Sammy. Bye, everybody. We'll see you when we can all get around the